Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's beginning to feel like spring outside, and I grew up in St. Louis, so spring means one thing. It means that St. Louis Cardinals baseball is right around the corner. And I grew up loving baseball, but somehow that never translated to my playing career. Let me share you, with you a little bit about that. Uh, so when I was in Little League, I played right field, because that's where they put all the best players, right? I retired from playing baseball in second grade at the top of my game. I led my team in hits, hits by pitches, right? Because second grade was the first year that the, that the players would pitch instead of the coaches, and so I would stand in there and take a 20-mile-an-hour fastball right to the shoulder for the sake of the team. Now, actually, I only had two actual hits that entire season. Uh, they came in the same game. I had a single early on in the game. And then going in the last inning, the game was tied. We had the winning run on base, and guess who came up to the plate? And by what can be only described as a miracle of God, I hit the ball over the center fielder's head for a walk-off double. So when you think about it, half of my hits won games. I'm still waiting for the Hall of Fame call on that record. Right? Half of my hits won games. I, I got hit by the most pitches, and so I decided I'm going to retire, walk off into the sunset at the top of my game. I mean, the real reason I retired is because I knew I'd kind of peaked at my skill level, and I wasn't ready for the next level, much less the big leagues. I think oftentimes that's how we can treat our faith, though. Is we kind of categorize, well, I'm okay with this league, but I'm not really ready for whatever's next. And so we become content being, part not being participants, but just being uh, inactive in the mission of the church. That, oh, that, that, that's for the professionals, that's for other people. And so we can say the Lord's Prayer, we can recite the Lord's Prayer without thinking of any of the words. We can see confirmation as us, us completing our little league stage and then say, I'm not ready for the next level. And so I'm going to treat it as, as graduation. I'm going to retire from church or even from the faith because I'm not ready for the big leagues. I'm not ready for what's next. I would rather be entertained than to be challenged, than to be invited into the mission. But it doesn't just impact our own worship, our own faith, it actually impacts our, our witness. Because I'm not equipped, I'm not ready to share in the mission of the church, and so I would rather just cheer on missionaries that are overseas. But meanwhile, I miss out on the mission opportunities that God is placing in my life each and every day, because I don't think I'm ready for them. I don't know enough, what if I say the wrong thing? And so instead, we're silent. And as, as the mission opportunities are passing us by, the mission itself suffers. Because what I end up telling God is, I'm not ready for the big leagues. But you can't always control when that call comes. See, I received a call a couple years back. I was from a 314 area code number, which is St. Louis area. And I didn't have it in my phone uh, so like most people of my generation, I didn't answer it. Uh, but I listened to the voicemail afterwards, and here's what the voicemail said. Hi, Brandon. This is Alex from the St. Louis Cardinals front office. We'd like you to call us today. The St. Louis Cardinals front office. I mean, those are the people that make the decisions on who's on the roster and how much they get paid. And they're calling me because they're in the middle of a playoff chase. And they must have heard about my Little League career. Half of my hits won games, and, and it's September. They need another win, and so they're calling me up to the big leagues. In reality, they just wanted to sell me some end-of-the-season tickets. But if it had been that call up to the big leagues, I would have said, no thanks. 
because I want my team to win. And if I know if I'm out there, then my team, it, it, the chances of them winning drastically decrease. Let's leave that to the professionals. When it comes to our faith, though, there are no professional Christians to leave the ministry to. There are professional church workers, but they're not professional Christians. See, thinking that they're professional Christians, that would be like saying, well, what, what's your job? Well, I'm a professional brother. Yeah, I get paid to be a part of this family. Sure, that there's probably some really rich families out there that that's practically how it works. But in reality, that's not exactly the case. See, your skill level, whatever you contribute to the family, doesn't make you more a member of that family. There are no professional family members. There are no professional Christians. You're a part of the family. It's, it's simply who you are. See, God doesn't take the mission of the church and leave it just to a select few. It's not about a few professionals that the rest of us get to just cheer on from the sidelines. No, all of us have been called up to the big leagues to be a part of God's mission in this world. You can't always control when that call comes. I mean, anytime you, you go to work and you have a chance to interact with one of your coworkers who's in need of hope, you're being called up to the big leagues. Parents, from the moment you become a parent, you have been called up to the big leagues. Whether you feel equipped or not, you've received that calling. Students, when you're deciding whether or not to give in to peer pressure, in that moment, you're called up to the big leagues to be a witness for Christ. See, you can't always control when the call comes. And you can't just wait for a professional to come in and take care of it for you. Because God has uniquely equipped you in that moment with those people, in the relationships that He's blessed you with. He's equipped you to be His witness. And it's easy to think, I don't know enough. I'm not equipped I can't do this. Lord, why would you call me up to the big leagues? I mean, can't you find a better option? Surely you can't be serious about calling me. God's response is, yes, I am serious. Don't call me Shirley. Just look at who God chooses throughout the ministry of the church. I mean, Moses had issues speaking, and he was a fugitive because he was a murderer. And that's not a great resume, and yet God chooses him. Peter gets in trouble constantly for saying the wrong things. Paul was an enemy of the church. I mean, God picks tax collectors and fishermen, seemingly all the wrong people. That's who God chooses. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, it's foolish it's like he picks a team of right field little leaguers. But God knows what he's doing. Here's verse 25 from our epistle reading from 1 Corinthians. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. See, God knows what he's doing even when it doesn't make sense to us. Here's verse 26. For consider your callings, brothers... Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. See, God doesn't respond to our objections, to our desire to sit on the sidelines, to not live mission-centered lives. He doesn't respond by simply being more selective in who he chooses. He doesn't invite just a select elite onto his mission. Because it's not about your qualifications. It's not about your eloquence. It's not about your words, your track record, or anything like that. That's not why God calls you. It's despite all that. Despite your sin, despite your desire to be on the sidelines, God calls you. Because the foolishness of God wiser 
than men. See, God gets us involved in the mission of the church by first making us the mission of the church. This is what God does for you on the cross. Paul says that the word of cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I mean, if there's anything that doesn't make sense, it's the cross. That God sends his son, and instead of wiping out rebellious humanity, he dies for us. He demonstrates his power through weakness and death. Instead of asking us to do some of the work, Jesus does it all. It's foolish. It's a stumbling block. And yet it's how we're saved. And then perhaps more foolishly, Jesus, after he's raised from the dead, he ascends into heaven and leaves this mission, leaves this ministry into the hands of people who abandoned him when he was on the cross. And they do it. Because God gave them everything they needed. It wasn't that they had impressive resumes, that they were the elite of the elite. It's because God always provides for those who he calls up. See, they had Christ and him crucified. That's all they had, and yet it was enough. You have the same calling. You've been called up to the big leagues. Well, the, the reality is there's only one league in the church. It's not like there's the big leagues for church work professionals and for missionaries, and then there's the little leagues for everyone else. Or there's the big leagues for adults and the little leagues for kids. No, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one league. The missionary league, if we borrow the L.W. Mel's terminology for a moment. We're all missionaries. We're all on the mission field. And we've all been equipped with exactly what we need to do what God has called us to do. Because like his disciples, you've been empowered with his Holy Spirit. You've been given the message of Christ crucified. It means you have everything that you need. Evangelism, the sharing of your faith, being called up to the missionary league, it seems like such a daunting task. But it's only daunting if we make it about us. But it's not about us. It's about him. See, being part of of the missionary league always remembers that you are a recipient of the mission. God is still at work in you. He's still forgiving you for the times that you'd rather stay on the sideline than be called into the ministry. He's still calling you to extend love and forgiveness and grace because that's what he's constantly extending to you. You're always a recipient of the mission that you're called to then share. And when you know that the mission is for you, it becomes a lot easier to share that with others because you're not telling people about some great thing that you've heard about. You're telling people about the God who has changed your life, who is changing your life. Because you have Christ crucified for you. You have everything that you need. That's what's at the heart of mission. And I had the chance to wrestle with this. Uh, for five years, I helped out with a witness workshop at the Lutheran High School in Jefferson City, Missouri. And so I was tasked with teaching uh, these high schoolers about witnessing, about evangelism for a couple days to prepare them for a workshop where they would actually witness uh, to people who were role-playing uh, situations that they would find themselves in in life. And so I started off by, by trying to teach them, all right, here's what other people believe. Here's common objections. Here's how you respond to them. I'm trying to make them experts in all of that. And yet each year as I taught that, I included far less every year of that kind of stuff. Because my job is not to be an expert in what someone else believes. Because they're already the expert. I just need to ask them questions. And so that's, as I 
went on in that process, that's what I taught more and more of. It's how to ask good questions. How to get to know their story. How to care for them as a child of God. And that in that conversation, how to see those moments that God's given you to share the hope that you have in Christ, to connect their story to the story of God's grace. To preach Christ crucified and risen for them. Because at the end of the day, that's all we have. And yet it works. Not just in a workshop, but in real life. It works because God changes people through the cross. Through a message that's that's foolish to the world, but brings salvation for all. And so where do you start? Well, I think one of the, the best ways to start in terms of sharing your faith is talk about your faith. Talk about Jesus with other believers. Primarily because they need Jesus too. But also because the more that you talk about Jesus with with fellow believers, the more that you talk about Jesus in your family, in your small group, with your friends, the more that you talk about how you're a recipient of the mission of God, that becomes a part of who you are. It's a natural overflow of your life. And so if you talk about it with people who also believe, you're going to end up talking about it with people who don't. So welcome to the big leagues. You've been called up in your baptism. You've been empowered with the Spirit of God. You've been given the message of Christ crucified. You have everything that you need. I mean, it's a message of foolishness to the world, but it's a message of salvation, of your salvation name of your crucified and risen Savior. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until the day that he calls you home. Amen.